So you could take any muscle cell, fat cell, skin cell, and you could turn it back into a baby stem cell, which is like embryonic in nature. So we take a skin biopsy from a patient. It can be from your own body or it can be a donor. And then we use cellular reprogramming. And this is kind of pressing like the reset button on the cell. How crazy is that, right? It, it, people, it's always hard to comprehend. It's like, wait, you mean I can turn anything in my body back to like a baby again? <laughs> Our guest today is Dr. Adil Khan, and he's a Canadian board certified physician and at the forefront of regenerative medicine, utilizing remarkable treatments that you're gonna learn about today. He's really transforming healthcare from the inside out, and he's helped to shape Eterna Health Clinics, a revolutionary concept in specialized healthcare, offering unparalleled treatment options that truly stand out in our current medical landscape. Why is muscle mass so critical as far as longevity is concerned? The number one reason is because muscle helps to regulate your immune system. So chronic inflammation or inflammaging, as it's been termed, is probably the main driver for aging. The definition of aging is, is kind of still, there's not a unified agreement on what that means exactly, but one of the theories is called the unitary theory of aging. And what it posits is that basically inflammation and oxidative stress are probably the two biggest drivers, which lead to reactive oxygen species, mitochondrial dysfunction, senescence associated secretory phenotype, genomic instability, all these different things that are basically the hallmarks of aging, which cause your body to get older and degenerate over time. Mm -hmm. And so what muscle does is upregulate something called T regulatory cells. So T reg cells, it's very nerdy, but they're probably my favorite cells in the body. Shout out <laughs> as to the a, T reg yeah, cells. <laughs> as, a cell, as a cell therapy uh, specialist kind of doctor, uh, I, love, I love to nerd out on cells. And so, T reg cells are these cool little molecules that so, so T cells in general, people probably are wondering what are T cells. So T cells is thymus, they come from your thymus gland. Um, and there's B cells that come from your bone marrow, uh, 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 bone marrow. So there's basically, those are B cells and those are both part of your adaptive immune system. And so adaptive immune system means like they have the memory and they can kill infections and pathogens and things that don't belong. But it's not just about killing viruses, it's also about protecting your immune system from dysfunction. Because that dysfunction over time, as it accumulates, that's what leads to loss of muscle, aging, all these degenerative conditions that we know are the main bane of existence in society. So what muscle does, and obviously Gabrielle talks about the organ of longevity, but I think the one thing that people don't talk about enough is immunohomeostasis and immunoregulation. Because that regulation of the immune system is really gonna prevent you from a lot of chronic disease. That's so fascinating. Again, that's the last thing people think about in regards to muscle. <laughs> but and, and what's so cool about it is something that we can proactively ba make. You know, it's really cool. Yeah, no, exactly. You're fighting, you're kind of fighting this natural process as you get older. After age 30, you you lose like something like half a percent of muscle mass per year. So you're naturally going to lose muscle if you're not going to do resistance training and other things to slow that down. So the the fascinating thing about regenerative medicine is that we can manipulate your body using cell gene therapy and even like bioelectricity now and all these cool things to change the signals so that you slow down this loss or even put it in the opposite direction like regenerate tissue mm. now what's so interesting is that okay so we've got this dynamic with with muscle in the immune system but it's really important for people to understand that muscle itself is really an endocrine organ, mm -hmm. right? So it's producing a lot of other things that would support longevity as well. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So <clears throat> I obviously talked about the T reg cells, but there's actual signals from the muscles called myokines and exerkines. So kinds basically just means movement and myo muscle, exer related to exercise. And then there's, so these are different cytokines. And cytokines, what that means are signals to the cell. Cyto means cell. But kind is just like movement. So there's movement of these signals and they go throughout the body. And so myokines are very interesting because what they do is they go throughout the body through the brain to reduce neuroinflammation, to help protect against dementia. There's myokines that help to improve insulin resistance. So it helps prevent diabetes. There's all these exerkines too, which are only released when you exercise. <laughs> so you can't, you can't get the benefit. Like I know there's a lot of gimmicky kind of let's say products out there where you're just like, oh, you just stand on this thing for like 15 minutes and you'll vibrate your body or whatever and you'll get the benefits of exercise. But I don't, th I, don't I think you need to actually physically move and, and sweat and there's all these other benefits that only happen when you're actually, and there's no way around it. I think you have to, you have to train. Yeah. 
of course, like that's one of those things where can we get a pill for that? Can we get some kind of, um, you know, futuristic input? But the cool thing is it life is movement, really, you know, if, if we want to just kind of bullet it down to that. But I was thinking about kinds and kinesiology and studying that in school and just studying human movement. And in reality, again, our bodies give us all this great feedback and reward for moving. And if we're lacking these inputs, then our body's going to be lacking and doing all kinds of cool stuff that it can do. And so what I've really picked up from studying you and your work uh, the past month really is you're inputting things to help people to continue to move and to extract all this value, right? And this gets us driving us into this domain of regenerative medicine, because as you mentioned, there's a significant loss in muscle mass as we get older. Um, in particular, number one, for the average person isn't doing you know, that in of itself, but for people that are proactively training and wanting to maintain their muscle mass, there's a lot that can be done there, but there's another level. And I want to talk to you about, well, first and foremost, what is regenerative medicine? And let's just start there. Yeah, at, at a very high level, it's basically just repairing or regenerating tissue back to a previous state. So you're basically trying, if your body's in a degenerative state or if there's some sort of damage, you're trying to take that back to the way it was. So the perfect example is like a tear in the muscle or tendon. So instead of getting the standard of care would be like surgery. Like you have to go get surgery, you sew it back together and then you're kind of on your way. So instead of having to get surgery, is there something we can do to kind of manipulate the body so that it will heal? And obviously this was a huge promise like even like 30 years ago is when it really started. Like Dr. Arnold Kaplan, who recently just passed away, he was the one who coined the term mesenchymal stem cells, which we'll chat about, but he was kind of like one of the godfathers of regenerative medicine. And so it was this whole promise that, hey, we can actually repair tissue instead of just having to cut stuff out or take this pill or just mask it. So it's this amazing idea that instead of having to take a pill to mask something or just having to cut you open, that we can actually get your body to heal. Hmm. All right. So first and foremost, our body in many ways, it already knows what to do to fix a lot of problems, but it's having the right conditions and the right signals, the right signals. <clears throat> exactly. And so with this being said, let's talk specifically about an injury. All right. So say somebody has a chronic shoulder injury that, you know, they've tried all this different stuff and they're just not getting better. This is oftentimes when people come and see you. Yeah. So let's talk about what you do versus a conventional approach. Yeah. And I mean, the reality is I treat a lot of high end pro athletes as well, like NHL, NFL players, stuff like that. And they have their own team doctors that are orthopedic surgeons. But what's a surgeon going to be good at? <laughs> Surgery. Yeah. Everything looks like a nail when all you have is a hammer. So unfortunately, this field of regenerative medicine is becoming its own specialty, meaning it's evolving so fast that they can't keep up and they don't they don't really know what's going on and they don't know the nuance. So a lot of times they brush it off and just be like, oh, well, you have to have this chronic pain. The standard kind of orthopedic surgeon will say, OK, try cortisone, which is an anti-inflammatory drug. If that doesn't work, you can take some anti-inflammatory medications and then just kind of manage it with physiotherapy. And if after like three, six months, not getting better, then you can do surgery. So that's kind of like standard of care. It's still pretty, that's still pretty the standard approach. And, but then there's this kind of huge gap of patients that aren't getting better with physio and then that don't necessarily want surgery. Plus that are, I think they deserve access to an option that is viable. And so that's where we come in and we say, okay, is there something we can do to get the body to heal on its own? And you you told me your story earlier, like you did it just with nutrition and movement. So imagine what you can do when you're actually sending signals, like the actual raw ingredients in there to kind of help your body to heal. So a lot of times we'll do our own assessment with ultrasound. I think the best story I like is, is when I went to, the first time I went to Dubai was to treat this man named Mohammed Alibar. He's the owner of the Burj Khalifa and Imar property. So he's he owns the six tallest buildings in the world and he's you know, the, the wealthiest man in Dubai, uh, business wise, uh, obviously there's a royal families and stuff like that, but he's well connected with all of them. So he flew me down because he had the shoulder issue for 20 years and it was same, same story, right? Cortisone, orthopedic surgeon, blah, blah, blah. And so he was kind of like, can you fix me? And I'm like, pretty sure I can. <laughs> and so we did an ultrasound, assessed it. We found some partial tears and then we just used platelet rich plasma injections to fix it. 
And for a lot of tendon and muscle tears, PRP is, works great. It's just where we take your blood, we concentrate it, but there's also nuance in PRP, which is the problem. There's different ways to prepare it. How, you, how, you, how fast do you spin it? What temperature do you do at it? Because it changes the cytokine profile, which are the growth factors and anti-inflammatory signals. And I was fortunate because I got trained by Dr. Anthony Gallia, who was kind of the godfather of PRP. He treated like Tiger Woods, A-Rod, lots of people. And he was the one who actually invented PRP for musculoskeletal conditions. Mm -hmm. Like he actually was the first one in the world to do it. So obviously he's, I learned from him. So I got to learn about the nuance of how to prepare PRP. Uh, but that was just like a simple case where you just need the right signals the body, once you give the right signals, because the plasma, what is the plasma? All it is is growth factors and cytokines that are just telling your body, okay, it's okay to start healing now. So there's stem cells that from the endogenous area start coming in. There's signals that start coming in and start repairing the tissue. And then, yeah, and then he was, you know, he's pain free now and he's good. And I, you know, his wife also had a similar issue in her knee. So, uh, you know, they were obviously, you know, like, what the heck? How come we never <laughs> had access to? And this man also has access to pretty much any doctor in the world, right? right, right. So it's like, if he, if he was struggling with this for years, um, it's really hard for a regular person to know how to navigate the system. And that, I would imagine, that's a pretty high stakes situation just a little bit if you screw <laughs> up you may uh you may not return <laughs> wow man that's that's really remarkable you know again like having access to you know all these different treatments but and and trying so many things and just struggling what what can block somebody f from healing you know when it comes to these signals being able to do what what they're able to do well that's yeah and that's always fascinated me it's like your body has this innate ability to heal as you've seen yourself but what is, I think it's a combination of genetics and obviously <clears throat> the inputs you give it. Because if you're not putting the right food, you're not doing the right movement, and then there's always going to be just that factor of just we don't fully understand, but most likely there's some genetic pathways in terms of regenerative medicine pathways because there's all these different pathways that signal and tell your body to heal. Like there's a pathway called the WINT pathway, WNT, but maybe there's some people who have genetic polymorphisms or some sort of variants that just don't allow their body to heal as well as other people's body. Because I, I have some patients who just, you know, they're so fragile <laughs> and they just don't heal from any, it's just so far, and they eat well, they exercise, they do all the basic stuff, but for whatever reason, their body just doesn't heal well. And so we have to, oftentimes we're working with those patients whenever they get tears, they just don't heal and we have to help them to heal. All right, so you mentioned PRP being uh, one possible treatment, but you, and we talked a little bit about this before we got started, are somebody who's really at the forefront of understanding this and it's super exciting i actually did uh, a lecture on this at my uh the university that i graduated from for their biology class like 10 years ago talking about stem cells that's so cool and i was talking about you know totipotent stem cells <laughs> and pluripotent stem cells and all these different things just what we knew at the time but there wasn't any there wasn't any valid interventions in medicine at the time to really talk about. Yeah. But we've come so far. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, it's exploding. And so I think for people to understand, because stem cell is such a blanket term, and there's different type of stem cells. So first, just the broad definition of a stem cell is something that can divide and potentially turn into different types of tissue and help to repair tissue. And the, the, the cool thing about stem cells is obviously their ability to regenerate new tissue. And but the issue is there's there's so many different types. So there's embryonic stem cells, which come from an embryo. And that's kind of like in the Bush era, there was a lot of controversy because obviously if you're taking them from embryos, that's very different. And a lot of people still think like, they're like, oh, so you're, you're taking, are you taking, they still think that, you know, there's still a misconception. We're not taking them from embryos. We're taking them from umbilical cord tissue because that's a very rich source of what are called mesenchymal stem cells. And mesenchymal is just an embryological term, but the point is these mesenchymal stem cells are still very pluripotent, meaning they can differentiate into different types of tissue, but they're not totipotent, meaning they can't turn into any type of tissue. So there are certain cell lineages where they have a propensity to differentiate into. And typically that's going to be like cartilage, muscle, tendon, bone. Uh, but that, but we still use it for other organ systems, not because we're trying to necessarily, re we know it's not going to regrow you like a new pancreas, but what it can do is it can improve the microenvironment and allow your body to improve that chronic inflammatory process that's causing that degeneration in the pancreas with like type 2 diabetes. That's why there's been trials done where you inject just mesenchymal stem cells into the pancreatic arteries and patients can actually get off insulin. And we've had, we've, we've, we've treated patients with that too, with type 2 diabetes. But so mesenchymal stem cells have this amazing ability to heal and 
reduce inflammation, but then it's like, okay, can we engineer these cells to control the signals? And this is, this is the part that I'm really excited about. It's, it's called synthetic biology. So meaning instead of just taking umbilical cord stem cells and manufacturing them and then injecting them in, we actually genetically engineer these cells in a lab. And then we, how we do that is using skin biopsy. So we take a skin biopsy from a patient. It can be from your own body or it can be a donor. And then we use cellular reprogramming. And this is kind of pressing like the reset button on the cell. It's called the Yamanaka factors. And Professor Yamanaka was a Japanese Nobel scientist. And the reason he got the Nobel Prize is because he figured out these are the four transcription factors. If we overexpress them, you can turn any somatic cell. So you could take any muscle cell, fat cell, skin cell, and you could turn it back into a baby stem cell, which is like embryonic in nature. How crazy is that, right? It, people, it's always hard to comprehend. It's like, wait, you mean I can turn anything in my body back to like a baby again? <laughs> like essentially, that's what he did. That's what he discovered. But the problem was with these what they're, they're called induced pluripotent stem cells or iPSCs and or I like to just call them Yamanaka stem cells easier to remember for people so these Yamanaka stem cells the problem was they're like embryonic so they're they're too much stemness meaning they can turn into tumors or they can keep growing and so this issue in the last five years has been how do we use these cells clinically without causing tumors there are still people using them but I, I would caution to be careful just because there's always that risk of these iPSCs or Yamanaka stem cells to keep on growing uncontrolled, like uncontrolled proliferation. So what we're doing is we have we have this unique cell line that has a gene edit to prevent uncontrolled proliferation. So these Yamanaka stem cells will not grow into tumors. And that's the patent technology that we've partnered with the company for. And what we can do is we can take these Yamanaka stem cells and we can turn them into different cell lines and then we can control them. So we can almost control the signals that they're going to send. So instead of just being like a, a umbilical cord stem cell, we can control the signals that they're going to send. So for example, we're working on making a mesenchymal stem cell that's specifically going to target aging by targeting the inflammasome. So this is it's, it's genetic engineering. And then we can also create like beta islet cells for the pancreas. That's already been done in clinical trials. There's, there's, I, there's what's called iPSC-derived dopamine-producing neurons, which can be transplanted into the brain for Parkinson's. And that's, that's clinical trial was published this year. And the results were amazing. Patients actually go into remission, and you actually get growth of new neurons. So you're actually treating and reversing disease. You're not just saying, okay, well, I guess you have Parkinson's, so take this pill for the rest of your life. So that's why it's such an exciting field. So, so it's kind of this intersection of cell therapy and gene editing and gene therapy coming together for kind of that next generation of cell therapy. And this would, I would imagine, be a much more lasting yeah. treatment versus, you know, something, again, you got to take a pill every day or whatever the case might be. Yeah, because you're actually repairing the tissue and you're regrowing new tissue that's going to be permanent and it's, it's engrafting. So it's, it's, it's this is, and this is already happening and this is just the beginning. So imagine where we're going to be in like five years or 10 years. It's going to be amazing for people with like chronic illness. All right. So, and I want people to really get this. So essentially the data or the signaling, which once you said this just now, it just makes complete sense because, you know, we're so fascinating. Life is so fascinating, but there's data when we're born, there's data in our cells, in our genes to make an adult. The mm -hmm. data is there, right? But it's just a matter of signaling. It's a matter of um, I would imagine, you know, certain things getting read a certain way. The same thing holds true as an adult. There's data there for a younger you. Mm -hmm. And you are talking about innovations that can read that data to control the signaling to start to basically print younger copies of ourselves. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's the holy grail, I would say, of anti-aging medicine would be epigenetic reprogramming which means basically imagine one day we can just reprogram all your cells back into a younger state, which is not science fiction. Like I think that would happen at some point. For now, what we can do is we can still infuse these stem cells into your body, which has a systemic effect on inflammation. They're immunomodulatory. So meaning, because a lot of people think they're like, why would you put stem cells intravenously? Because they think, you know, you're trying to repair tissue and regrow tissue. But stems, the first generation stem cells, especially more than anything, are signaling molecules, meaning they are going to help to reboot 
or reprogram your immune system, which is called immunomodulation. And that's why it's been shown to help with like inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, all these different conditions that are autoimmune based because it's rebooting the immune system because your immune system is kind of becoming haywire. So it's like, how do you get it back to a state where it's not it's sending the wrong signals anymore? All right. So hearing some of this previously, I had certain concerns bubbling up, which I want everybody to know. I'm going to get to those questions. All right. So just buckle in tighter. And we're going to keep <laughs> on this roller coaster. Now, the next place I want to go to is actually we're circling back to something you mentioned, which is just mind blowing in and of itself. You mentioned this as a highly effective treatment for diabetes and not just again, this isn't a. A, a, a symptoms treatment. This is actually addressing the root cause. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Because obviously diabetes has exploded mm -hmm. in our population today. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. And again, what's one of the main drivers of diabetes? It's the inflammasome. The inflammasome is this pathway called the NLRP3 pathway. It's a very nerdy thing, but basically this pathway, when it gets activated, it sends, it activates interleukin uh, one beta and all these inflammatory cytokines and those inflammatory cytokines are what lead to insulin resistance and prevent the cells from being able to read those signals from insulin and lead to this chronic inflammatory state that goes hand in hand with type 2 diabetes. So with that understanding, because obviously people understand that my blood sugar is high, but why is your blood sugar high? It's because of insulin resistant, which comes back to chronic inflammation and the inflammasome. So that's that's kind of the gist of it. So with that understanding, what the stem cells are doing is when we inject them into the pancreas. So what we do is we infuse them via pancreatic artery injection and we infuse them into the pancreas and liver, which helps to basically reduce that inflammatory environment, allowing your body to your beta islet cells to produce more insulin and reducing the inflammation. So those signals get sent better. So your body, your insulin sensitivity improves. So then that's how you can reduce the medications and even get off insulin. There's a trial in India that was published this year. They had, I think, 40 patients or so, but it showed with just mesenchymal stem cells, like the first generation ones, that patients, many of them got off insulin. The ones who were on insulin actually got off. Like, how crazy is that? Right. Just with one treatment. Right. And this, this will be an endogenous insulin production. I would imagine like the receptor sites, all exactly. this, your body's intelligence is going to take over. Exactly. And that's the thing. Your body has this innate ability to heal and we're just putting the right signals and environment for it to do it. So, and type one, but diabetes is definitely more complicated because type one is there's an autoimmune component to it. And then there's also the fact that you don't have those beta islet cells that produce insulin. The beta islet cells are in the pancreas that help to make insulin. And so those are going to be in lower number and they get attacked by your own immune system. So for that, the first generation stem cells will help, but they're not going to cure it. So what, what's being done, there's a company called Vertex that published a trial this year about uh, injecting beta islet cells. So you, you use that Yamanaka stem cell, you make a baby stem cell, and then you differentiate it into a beta islet cell. So now you have these beta islet cells and you transplant them via infusion into the pancreas. And now you have new beta islet producing insulin cells. And that can get patients actually into remission. But the problem with that specific cell line was that they were immunogenic, so people had to go on immunosuppressants. So the cell, we're gonna be doing a similar trial later this year, but what we're gonna do is we're using the, cell, the technology we have, you don't have to go on immunosuppressants, and then we're also gonna have an autoimmune protocol using fecal microbial transplant, transplanting new gut bacteria and the peptides and bioregulators to reboot the immune system so it doesn't attack itself in combination with the beta islet cells. All right. This is revolutionary, you know, in this context with type 1 diabetes, but, you know, just to turn back a little bit with type 2 diabetes, which the vast majority is the the onset of this is because of certain lifestyle factors, uh, inputs into the body, you know, lack of movement, these different things. We know these are key components. And my question is, if we're coming in and utilizing these treatments, are we not interfering with the body's adaptation or signaling for behavior change, right? If we're not addressing what caused this issue in the first place, because basically some of these symptoms would manifest as the body's trying to inform us to stop eating those fucking Twinkies. Well, yeah, if we, if we transplant these new cells and you go back to Twinkies and you're probably just going to destroy your body again. And so you have to have that behavior component to it. And that's that's the reality of it. 
I think the this problem for me is that you know I've been I've been studying this stuff forever, and I just it's there's so many systems issues for people to sustain behavior change, meaning the environment, the the food industry, the soils depleted. Like there's all these factors, and and plus now there's socioeconomic stress too, right? It's hard to live. It's expensive to live a healthy lifestyle too, and it's not always easy and accessible. So it's like. What's going to have the most impact on society, I think, in the long run is going to be these interventions because they're going to allow people to at least heal and then hopefully give them a chance to be able to maintain it afterwards. I just think there has to be so many changes at a regulatory and systems level for people to sustain behavior change, unfortunately, because it's just like it look it's not like our rates are going down. I feel like a lot of people know how to live a healthy lifestyle, but they can't maintain it. And it's really it's a really difficult problem to solve. It's like, how do we get more people to maintain positive behavior change? I do think these therapies will help with that because there is data to suggest, for example, like the microbiome, there's people who are less likely to work out and more obese have dysregulated gut uh, dysbiosis, meaning they have an imbalance in bacteria and it can affect their behavior. So meaning there's actually been studies showing, for example, depending on the type of gut bacteria you have, it may actually affect the response you get to exercise. So meaning you don't get that same dopamine rush and you don't feel good after exercise. So you don't want to stick to it because you don't feel good. And that has to do with your gut bacteria. So if we can change how your body responds to exercise with these therapies and you feel great, then hopefully that'll help with compliance. Mm. This is fascinating. All right, so I think it would be a prerequisite. We're talking about changing our current system of healthcare. All right. So yes, with the new technology, but also with having a more, um, and I don't like to use this word holistic because it's been, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, this has been, <laughs> yeah. And so, but more of a holistic approach, looking at all these factors saying, Hey, you know what? We've got this incredible treatment where you're not going to require these constant insulin injections anymore, but you have to understand what caused this condition in the first place. And so we have to have these adjunct lifestyle changes in addition to this treatment and so it's like really treating the whole person the whole lifestyle versus today you know i i'm just gonna i mean i can't really give an estimate but i'm just gonna say like nine out of ten times the physician is not walking the patient through what caused type 2 diabetes in your body here are the lifestyle factors it's because they don't know (laughs) it's because and this is where i want to ask you about this how did you get into this field at this level and because your your backstory is fascinating, it's uh, it's just because I have ADHD, <laughs> and so it's uh, it's also obviously I like to ask questions. I, I, I was always curious in medicine. We, we so we we study allopathic medicine, which is a traditional medical school training. But then during that time, I studied integrative and functional medicine, which I'm sure your audience is familiar with because you you guys talk about that. But functional medicine, the whole idea behind it is okay. Can we actually figure out the underlying molecular mechanisms that are driving the disease. And the science of that has improved dramatically in the last 10 years. So I'm kind of calling it interventional functional medicine, where it's like we can actually intervene with these different cell and gene therapies and peptides and bioregulators and now microbes. And we can actually intervene to a cellular level and understand exactly what we're doing to affect specific pathways to get your body to heal. So that specificity is improving so much. And but unfortunately, the medical education system is still what's called system based. So you learn about the heart, you learn about the brain, you learn about the gut, but they're, they're all connected. (laughs) And that's and and what better way to demonstrate this to the world than aging. And that's why I think this huge investment of hundreds of billions of dollars going into aging research is going to help humanity so much because aging is the most complex chronic disease. And if we can solve for that, we can solve for so many other chronic diseases. And because aging, we figured it out. It's it's 10 to 12 hallmarks, which I talked about earlier. We know what are the drivers of aging. This is it's a pretty good unified theory now. So now that we have that fundamental principles, we can intervene and create interventions to actually tr- address those. They're still being worked on, obviously. But the point is, those molecular mechanisms, let's call them, I like to call them first principles or fundamental principles of biology, just like in physics, they had first principles that govern different laws, like like Newtonian mechanics, like the three Newton like Newton's three laws, right? And so, once you have those laws, it gives you a basis on how to innovate and how to figure out how things work. And the problem is, doctors don't even know what those laws are because we're not taught them, and it's not their fault. So we're taught just okay, this is the problem at a surface level, and this is how you're going to intervene from a drug or surgical solution. 
but they don't understand the molecular mechanisms because and it's also like I don't blame them it's, it's, it is a lot of work and it's a lot of science and it's not as dry in a sense you know what I mean it's like you have to go back to molecular basics biochemistry and cellular pathways and all this other stuff and that's not the most exciting stuff for a lot of physicians they just want to you know they just want to do what they want to do so when you were in med school you were already so you had your workload there with your conventional training but you were studying some things that were not a part of your curriculum i would imagine yeah no they were definitely not <laughs> so i read i read a bunch of textbooks so that were not anything to do with what we learned about and then so how do we go from you know med school into practice like were you what what was your pathway to you know again working with the the Burj Khalifa guy <laughs> and Tony Robbins and all this stuff it was uh, it, I was lucky because I think I just saw things a little bit differently and I knew I didn't want to be a conventional doctor I had to start out that way because there's no way you have to still pay the bills, right? So I still worked in Emerge. I still did the traditional stuff and I had to, you know, but I never like, it wasn't like I was passionate about that stuff. But then I was I was fortunate because I, when I worked with Dr. Gallia, he was obviously kind of the pioneer of PRP and sports medicine. And so working with him, I saw, okay, this guy's obviously, and there's a reason like why are, I was like, why are all these like high profile people coming to him if this stuff doesn't work? Let's just say it doesn't work or it's like be, or it's quackery or whatever like these people whose lives depend on their bodies like high professional multi-million dollar athletes are coming to him there must be a reason so that and that's how i got exposed to regenerative medicine but regenerative medicine is so much more now especially it's it's it, like we were talking about it's, it's signaling and it's so many it's more than just plasma injections obviously and so that's kind of when i started going down that road i kind of became very good at treating people with sports injuries but then i was like okay what else can I do with regenerative medicine? And then that's how I got into cell therapy and then cellular engineering and then gene therapy. And, and then and then also like manipulating the body using peptides and bioregulators, which are signals that help with organ function. And so that's how and now it's like I treat a lot of complex chronic diseases that fall out of the regular realm of what doctors can normally do because we're looking at it from a fundamental principles approach. So meaning, because a lot of people are like, oh, what kind of doctor are you? And I'm like, I don't even know how to explain it anymore. <laughs> mm, yeah. I just say I'm a cell and gene therapy specialist because I don't, it's like, I'm not really an intervention, I'm an interventional pain sports doctor by training, but like I treat people with like PTSD and trauma by injecting their vagus nerve and re rebooting their nervous system. I treat people with like all these weird immune conditions and like long COVID and all sorts of stuff because I'm looking at, at the body from a molecular mechanistic first principles approach. So it's very different. It's like, so it's hard to, it's hard to put me in a bucket of just saying I'm like this type of doctor. And that's, and that's the whole system that eventually I think medical education, and there's a paper written by this by a great infectious disease doctor in like 2011. So it's not like new. He actually said like, we need to change our curriculum to be based off molecular mechanisms instead of system based. And that was like 10 years, like over 10 yeah. years ago. And no one listened to the man. So yeah. <laughs> it's like, so we're still, I don't, I don't see much change happening for a while, but I'm hoping to at least like help with that movement. But it's going to take, the only way I see that change happening is for us to become like an institution, which means we become like a large entity with like, you know, a, like a, bio, a big biotech clinic based company where we're worth a lot of money and then we can do endowments to universities and then we can change the system. Oh, you just said it. I was going to ask you about this, like, <laughs> yeah. because you, in many ways, this is, this is a battle because we have a certain structure and it's very lucrative and it's very integrated into our current system of education. You just mentioned endowments to you know uh, universities, and these universities, for example, they're not trying to lose out on this money. Neither is you know right now our gross domestic product. Like a huge portion of that is our healthcare system. Is like and tuition fee and up. tuition right tuition debt like in U.S. is crazy. Right, right. And so you know, and I, I shared this years ago, man. You know, it was already like four point two trillion dollar healthcare system, and here in the United States, it is the, we, we invest more into healthcare, seemingly superficially, mm -hmm. than any other, you know, developed country, but we have some of the worst health outcomes, like something's not matching up. And we've got to be honest about this. I want to ask you about this. When you are really, when you're bringing in some treatments that are highly effective, that don't require this constant kind of revolving door mm -hmm. of treatment, taking a drug over and over and over again, which is a cash cow for the pharmaceutical industry. 
we're talking about we're talking about moving in on trillions of dollars mm -hmm. of income for these entities i would imagine they're not going to be happy about this no I've, I've been told by multiple people i should get a bodyguard but, <laughs> but i'm not there i'm not there your yet. bodyguard <laughs> that you brought today <laughs> is you know she, she okay okay i'm gonna i'm gonna watch she's, my she's tongue. more fierce than that she likes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, she'll beat you with fashion <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but you know but it's yeah just, it's it's and uh the analogy i always use is tesla because I was an early investor in Tesla. And so I saw firsthand how much mainstream media can create a narrative. So Tesla started like IPO like in 2010. And then from like 2015 to 2020, all the big hedge fund managers, all the big, all the CNN, NBC, everyone was like, sell, sell. Tesla's going bankrupt. Like there's no chance there. Cause, cause why? Because they're disrupting an entire industry that was based around internal combustion engines, right? So these other manufacturers and there's only really four of them for the big four type of you know and it's like you're, you're coming into their space that they've been around for like 100 years and no one's ever succeeded before so they're going to do everything in their power right. to make sure you don't succeed and tesla was the most shortest stock in history at one point it was shorted 33 percent shorting just means like these hedge fund guys are betting that they're going to go bankrupt and they're going to make money when it goes bankrupt <laughs> and so that's why Tesla went something there was something called a short squeeze. And that's what I, I, I was a beneficiary of that because these guys, obviously, because they're shorting it so much and the opposite happened, Tesla did well, then these guys got burnt. And then that's how the stock went 10 X in like a couple months. But what I learned from that experience was that the media has a really powerful way to control the messaging and what people believe and see. And you can't always believe and see everything you read. And that's just and that's just a fact. And I think it's it, if I didn't see myself with Tesla, I'd be like, oh, no, you're just a conspiracy theorist. But after seeing that, it's like and then COVID was just amplified that right by like and then it's actually I think COVID was good for society in a way because it opened up a lot of people's eyes to be a little bit more distrusting of what their doctors say, of what the media says and do your own, you know, educate yourself a little bit, get different sources. Don't just trust me and you either necessarily do your research like find multiple people and find multiple sources i think the best way to educate yourself is always try to whatever view you think you know about something challenge yourself by looking at the exact opposite and then try to figure out okay what's where's the truth yeah and this could be obviously a very profitable business model but the current business model is set up in a certain way where there's this i mentioned this earlier revolving door of patients and treatments largely ineffective we just keep getting sicker and sicker losing more and more function it's not really matching up to good outcomes right but that's the way the system is right now and so encroaching on that with something again that can be profitable if the system isn't set up for them to reap the benefits of what you're doing that's a big part of the of the struggle so i would imagine also which happens a lot you know you you see a certain industry starting to take off and then the kind of later adapters or adopters start to jump on board right so you see the same thing happening with organic yeah you know labeling right so at first there's come some fringe people doing this weird thing saying you know we're not spraying our foods with pesticides herbicides or denticides suicide whatever <laughs> we're not putting that stuff on our food and you know it's just like it's this weird thing and then suddenly we see more and more people demanding it the next thing you know general mills or whoever is just like you know we have organic too you yeah know? Exactly. just trying to get in on a trend or something that's in high demand yeah and big big pharma isn't stupid obviously they're a massive entity uh, and they are figuring this out and they're starting to get into cell and gene therapy manufacturing but they're they are very far behind and they're also trying to do it in a way what they tried to do with like psilocybin which was like they try to patent these things and then try to say like you know and make the price like a hundred times more and and then try to corner the markets so it's a very unethical way of operating and so and the other thing is they're very reductionistic which is that they're always trying to just find one way to treat the body because that's patentable but a protocol isn't necessarily a patented thing, right? And so the way we're going to do our clinical trials is it's going to be more protocol based. But then we actually want to get people better permanently. <laughs> we're not just trying to keep them to coming back. And obviously, making pills is also a lot cheaper than making cells. So from a 
operating like leverage perspective long term, it's obviously going to be way more profitable for them to continue to push pills and make it seem like this stuff is not really there yet. When in reality, it's already, we're already treating so many people. And it's not like just, just me in Japan, in China, in Korea, in Dubai. These are all places where these things are legal and approved for over 10 years. In the US, it's still illegal to do culture expanded stem cells, which are the ones that are manufactured and grown. So anyone doing them in the States is obviously taking a risk, but they're also but then you also have to question where they're getting it from. That's why I'm not a huge fan of the doctor. There's so many stem cell clinics, you know, in, in California and in Florida, but they're all not doing it the right way. You you actually posted something about kind of opting out of this the system in Canada. Yeah. And somebody <laughs> reached out to you. Talk about that. Yeah, that was so interesting. It, it, so someone from it's, they work with this uh, contract research organization, CRO, and then they work closely with Health Canada. And they're like, I, they're like, please don't leave, <laughs> basically. And so we're actually doing, uh, so they helped us to get the approval. So we're actually doing a, a phase two study for our follistatin gene therapy in Canada for sarcopenia. Amazing. So, so follistatin, since now explained what it is, follistatin is a peptide that's been around for like 20, 30 years, especially in the bodybuilding community because it inhibits myostatin which is an enzyme that sets a limit on how much muscle you can put on. So people have probably seen those jack cows, like those really yoke cows. There's because they have a myostatin deficiency. They have a genetic mutation where they make no myostatin. So obviously having less myostatin means more muscle. So it's not like, so there's always this interest in phallostatin for bodybuilders, but the problem is it has such a short half-life. It only stays in your body for like 90 minutes. And so no one can really figure out, okay, like who, who's going to inject themselves like 10 times a day to be able to, you know, do that. I mean, I'm sure there's some crazy people, but for the most part, that's not a sustainable approach. So what our gene therapy vector does is it basically is a delivery mechanism to keep your phallostatin levels high for about 18 to 24 months. And so that way you have one injection and your phallostatin stays good for 18 to 24 months. And that helps to de-age your body. We've shown in our, we did our phase one trial already. We had some patients who de-age their body by like 10, 15 years based off intrinsic biological age reduction. And then they have more muscle, more energy, more strength. It, make, it makes it easier to put on muscle. And you just feel great. You feel a sense of vitality. And it's been, and, and, and obviously it's also going to be, we're trying to get to be the first treatment in the world for sarcopenia. And then hopefully have insurance companies cover it eventually. Oh man, this is amazing. Amazing. So I want to circle back because a big part of the longevity equation for just the conventional mindset and treatments that are available right now is hormone therapy. You've got some really cool things going on as far as testosterone is concerned. Let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So using that same delivery mechanism, we can create what's called lutein luteinizing hormone gene therapy. So you do one injection and luteinizing hormone is the signal to your body to help produce more testosterone. So you're not taking exogenous testosterone, you're just you're just having this peptide vector. The vector is this plasmid, which is just a circular strand of DNA. And what it does is it just produces more of this luteinizing hormone, which will help your body to produce more testosterone. And the cool thing is with the LH gene therapy, you don't have to inject yourself with testosterone every week or take the cream. You just do one injection and you're gonna be good for 18 to 24 months. So it's gonna disrupt obviously the traditional TRT and HRT kind of industry. So it's going to be exciting to disrupt a lot of industries at once. <laughs> I really wanted to have this conversation because, you know, a lot of people listening are very interested in and invested in taking care of their health. But I also wanted to be known and for us to be aware that we're living in very different circumstances than the, than the environment that we evolved in. And we need to have things at our disposal, accessibility to, to things to help us to adapt and to address this ever-changing, very strange environment that our genes just aren't vibing with right now. And so utilizing science, utilizing innovations to help us is just a smart way to go because we can't, we're, we're all living here in this glorified, glorified snow globe together, you know, and we, we don't have off earth living as, you know, as of now to our knowledge. Yeah. Adam Sandler has a movie coming out. I don't know if you saw this called Spaceman or something where he's like living off planet in like a space pod. <laughs> and I think it's like over a hundred days and he starts to have a friendship with an alien maybe, <laughs> which he doesn't know if it's real or not. But it's just, I just got this from the preview. I'm saying all this to say that that reality isn't our reality right now. We're all here together and the very air that we're breathing is very, very different. We need to stack conditions in our favor to be more resilient. Exactly. 
But what I really was connected with with your work is helping us, giving us the opportunity to to move our bodies, to train more, to be stronger, to be more resilient in a very practical way by, um, you know, even just to circle back, and this is my question I have for you, in this conversation with testosterone, obviously TRT is a, is a very popular treatment right now, and taking endogenous hormones, whether it's, you know, um, hormone therapy for menopause or, you know, with testosterone, whatever the case might be, but giving your body, putting the signaling in your body for your body to create it itself, and also doing this to where you don't have to keep on doing this treatment over and over again, that's so powerful. It is. And it's exa- you took the words out of my mouth, which is I always say it's about resiliency. So what we're doing by transplant, I like to use the word transplant because we're transplanting cells into your body. We're transplanting plasma vectors into your body. We're plas- transplanting gut microbes into your body. And all these different things by transplanting them gives your body more resiliency to deal with the evolutionary mismatch that we have as you said, our, there's a huge mismatch between our genes and our current environment. And that mismatch is only getting broader. <laughs> With that, and that, that means is we're going to have more and more chronic diseases. As we can see, the rates just keep increasing. So what can we do from an interventional perspective that can say, okay, let's bring it closer together so that gap isn't as wide. And one of my favorite studies I read recently was about, there was this Olympic athlete who is from Taiwan and who happened to be a microbiologist as well. So, so she's like superwoman, right? And and so and she, she was like a world champion weightlifter. And so they studied her microbiome, and then they found this bacteria called OLPO1, and it's so like Olympic. They call it Olympic something bifidobacterium. And when they transplant that microbe into other people, it actually improves their cardiovascular fitness. How crazy is that? <laughs> so it's like, and so we're going to make that product where this is in our pipeline. We're doing FMT manufacturing. So our first one is just for longevity and anti-aging, but our second generation will be more specific. So we're, we're doing, we have our own manufacturing plan for that. But, but basically imagine you can take just a, a microbe that's going to make your body more resilient because you're going to be healthier and fitter. And that's, that's what these cell and gene therapies and all these different things are designed to do. As I said earlier, as we said before the, the show, it's, it's kind of this medicine 4.0 concept, which is using cell and gene therapy and manipulating your body so you can do healthier things longer, like training and eating well and all that stuff. Because eventually, aging catches up to you. So it's like, can, how can we extend that curve so that you can have more good years? Yeah. And there's a huge industry right now, obviously, for superficial treatments for... Um, for looking younger, yeah. right? So, you know, obviously plastic surgery is huge right now, but just let's talk a little bit about uh, another super popular um, treatment that people have done, Botox, right? So something like Botox, again, this is a superficial treatment of something that you could possibly do, and I wanna ask you about this, with some of the protocols that you have. Yeah, exactly, you can you can combine them. If you want the more immediate effect of your wrinkles looking less, for sure, you can do Botox, but let's come back to molecular mechanisms. Why is your skin aging in the first place? You lose elastin, you lose collagen, there's oxidative stress, there's inflammation, the mitochondrial dysfunction. It's the same, it's the same underlying mechanisms as to why the skin starts to lose its elasticity and why it starts to lo- lose its uh, volume. A lot of it, and that's atrophy as well, fat loss and muscle loss and whatnot. And so if you look at it from a cellular level, that's like, how do we restore functioning of the skin? Guess what? You can do that with cell therapy <laughs> and engineered cell therapy, especially now, because so we have we have what's called a engineered exosome product. It comes it comes from the skin biopsy, and then we use that for the face because that exosome because it stimulates fibroblasts, which stimulate collagen production, and then we can combine. And then exosomes are also very anti-inflammatory and help with oxidative stress. So they're targeting all these different mechanisms. And then if you want, you can do it with Botox at the same time if you want something more immediate because that's slowing down the skin aging process. But it's also going to give you a more natural look. And, and the other thing is this technology is only becoming better. Like we're, we're going to be able to, like there's companies already working on engineering cells specifically for the face to fight the aging process in the face. So I think if for skin health and skin vitality, this is going to be a long-term solution. And we do, we do something called a stem cell facial, which is using these you know, 30 million stem cells or so in combination with these skin fibroblast cells, the exosomes, uh, and then we inject them into face, and it lasts for like three years or so. So you don't have to get them done all the time. And this is something I learned in Switzerland and Japan, the, pl- the plastic surgeons I work with over there, they've been doing this for like a decade. Mm-hmm. So it's like, 
and they're plastic surgeons. So I'm like, if they're plastic, they're not doing facelifts on everyone. They're doing this. Mm -hmm. So why is that? It's because people want don't like it's a, it's an actual way to make your skin healthier and and I think it just looks better anyway. But <laughs> all right, let's that part. Let's talk about some of the truth about Botox. Like, what is it actually doing? Yeah, it's paralyzed. It's just basically a toxin, and that's basically stopping a signal for your muscles to contract. So it's paralyzing them. But what does that do over time? It atrophies the muscle. Mm. So what happens when the muscle atrophies? Then you lose that volume. So you're actually going to look worse. And you got to keep doing more and more and more. This is a, it's a cult. <laughs> it's like once you're in it, you're in it for life. And if and if you get out, then you you see the effects of it really drastically. So I think for young women, especially a lot of them are considering Botox. Like I would really consider this approach, the cellular medicine approach. But the problem again is there's like to do it the right way which is the way I learned it in those countries is you can't do that in the U.S. because you can't do those culture expanded stem cells in the U.S. So the dosing is important because if you don't, a lot of people in the States who do stem cells, they're using, when you take just a stem cell from your own body or you're just using non-expanded stem cells that are not grown, you're getting maybe 500,000 to a million stem cells. So the dose isn't there. So we use like 30 million for the face. For IV, we use like 200 million or 300 million. So the dose is very important because a lot of people be like, oh, I had stem cells at this clinic in like Florida and it didn't work. I'm like, ah, you didn't have stem cells. <laughs> Those are technically called committed progenitor cells. They're, it's a very technical term, but basically they're, they're more, they're not actually true stem cells, meaning they don't have that ability to really repair tissue the same way. Mm. You got to talk more about that because this is the difference when people, for example, believe that they're getting regenerative medicine treatment. There's really a huge difference. There is because it, it committed progenitor cell just means progenitor means it it's it's not fully differentiated, but committed means it can only go down a certain cell line. So they're they're not they can only turn into like when you take your fat or bone marrow, which is what what's allowed in the U.S. and that's the type of stem cell, but it's not really a stem cell because it's mixed in with so many other things and you're not, you need to isolate the mesenchymal stem cell from the bone marrow or the fat and then you need to grow it for three to four weeks in a lab then you can inject it or infuse it and that's a true stem cell product so that's illegal in the u.s still and so why it's illegal is you know beyond me but <laughs> fda is fda and i wouldn't i wouldn't be so skeptical until i traveled and i worked in like japan and, and dubai and all these other places where they've been doing it forever and those are legitimate countries you know i mean they're not like like colombia or panama no offense to those countries but like they're not the most technologically and innovative countries japan's a very high technological innovative country and they actually have some of the best medicine in the world in terms of like actual uh, technological advances and surgeries and stuff like that and their lifespan is longer than ours rates of chronic disease are significantly lower yeah so something's working yeah um i want to ask you about this because you know a big part we started this off with talking about muscle and that is a huge component of longevity and of course maintaining function being able to do the things that we want to do but also being a reservoir for hormones that help to keep us youthful and energetic and strong and also as you mentioned the immune system component to that now it's one thing to utilize treatments to build and maintain healthy muscle mass to keep us younger but what about everything else you know what about you know you got somebody who's just absolutely jacked and you know energetic but they can't remember where they are you know what i mean because of the brain and the nervous system not coming along for the ride so how does that integration happen how do we keep our brain and nervous system young as well yeah the best i think there are different interventions to dh the brain as well now like ex like intravenous exosomes so exosomes when you grow stem cells the the i always say the chicken it's like chicken soup the chicken the meat part is the stem cells and the soup is the broth and that broth is, uh, sorry, the broth is basically the exosomes. So the exosomes have all the nutrients in there, the cytokines, and they cross the blood brain barrier. And I've actually, I had an NFL athlete who I think you might know, John Wellborn. Yeah. He's friends with Rob. And yeah, so John Wellborn, so he had MRIs done in 2011, and he had a lot of brain damage from football, right? From re uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy type of stuff, right? Where there's actual, because of repetitive head traumas. And then after doing a couple of intravenous exosome treatments, he also did hyperbaric oxygen and a few other things, but he, he found that the exosomes were the thing that made the most difference. 
like he, he cognitively and mentally, he actually felt so much better and had like no symptoms. And then they did an MRI like 10 years later and his brain was like back to normal. Like he didn't have the damage anymore. Amazing. So how, like how crazy is that? Yeah, exactly. That's what I was like. I just like, and when you see those actual changes, you're just like, wow, this should be more accessible because obviously we're, we're using it for dementia. We're using it for, uh, you know, different type of uh, neurodegenerative conditions. My, I have a neuro interventional radiologist on my team and he actually injects the stem cells directly into the brain. And it's, it's, it's just uh, like, it's going to be life-changing for people. Uh, and this is just the first generation stem cells. The second generation where we, we differentiate them into neural progenitor cells or into actual specific cell lines that can regrow new neurons. It's just like they did in that study for Parkinson's. So that's, that's where we're headed. All right. Now I'm going to ask you the big question. All right. Now, all of these are big questions, <laughs> but one of the biggest fallacies that has taken place in recent human history when it comes to our health and medicine is this strange separation of our mind and body. It's, it's just very, it's, I, it's remarkable to me how, how strange it is. And recently, as of this recording, you know, the last person to actually sit in this chair before you, she's really considered the, the mother of mindfulness. She's been at Harvard as a psychologist, first woman, woman to receive tenure in the psychology department, I think she's been there for 40 years, something like that. And all of these studies just affirming how much our mind influences our health outcomes. Yeah. Uh, how our thoughts, you know, every thought that we think is altering our chemistry. And so I'm saying all this to say, what about this intersection with our, our minds and being able to appropriately process our environment? The, all, we, what, I, what I'm trying to ask you is, we have all these different environmental inputs and our bodies are making adaptations based on our perception of these things. With these treatments, are they going to be interfering with our body's innate intelligence to help us to adapt? No, they, they actually help to kind of re, they only work where they needed. That's, that's the cool thing about, and I'm sure you know about peptides. That's kind of how, so peptide, the first peptide isolated and synthesized was like insulin, like 100 years ago, right? And it's a signal to your body to lower blood sugar. But now we have peptides that can help with like brain health, that can help with concentration, that can help like Ozempic, that helps with weight loss, right? And so these these signals kind of work where they need it to. So it's more modulating as opposed to like a drug, which is forcing something. That's a big difference. And I, we see that clinically. So the, one of the treatments we do for helping with mind-body connection is a vagus nerve treatment. So what we do is we inject exosomes and peptides into the vagus nerve, and then we do what's called a stellate ganglion block into the sympathetic ganglion, which is innervates your sympathetic nervous system. And a lot of people are, are in this hyper aroused state where it's obviously if you have PTSD or trauma or unresolved emotional trauma, which is very common, but even just in modern day environment with everything that's going on, a lot of people hold all this anxiety and stress and it's, it sits in that nervous system. And so people can't, like, people can't build that mind-body connection because they're disconnected from their body. They don't have it. <laughs> and it's like, you can tell them to meditate all day, but if you have this nervous system dysfunction, it's not going to do anything for you. So how do you rewire your body so you get the most benefit from those inputs? And that's what these interventions allow to do. That one of, one of the patients I had recently was a perfect example. He's a, he's a special forces operative and he had really severe PTSD and he tried all the conventional stuff, including, you know, mindfulness, every, uh, you know, therapy and so many different pharmaceuticals. But just after the treatment, it calmed down his nervous system to a point where he started, you know, he started crying after the procedure because he was just like, I haven't felt relief in years. And it was, it was just unbelievable. And now he's not suicidal anymore. He's back to like playing hockey he's with his kids. Like he's just happy and like living life now, but he can, now he can do the therapy and the meditation, but some people state, is so hyper aroused that they can't benefit from meditation. So that's where these interventions can be really powerful. Now, with all this being said, obviously, you know, you've been at the forefront of so many aspects of regenerative medicine, really for many of us redefining what that is and tuning us into something that's just mind blowing. But where is the place for our mind as a human being within this? And is there still a role here for us training, not just through interventions, but training our mindset to be uh, compatible with these treatments and not taking the mind out like conventional medicine has? Of course, chronic pain, which is a huge part of my practice, is to a 
certain degree a mind body connection and i've seen this when i had a patient where i did that vagus nerve injection and then his chronic pain in his knee that he had for like 20 years went away mm. and i was like how's that even i was like how's that even possible it's it's it, it almost makes you question everything it, like i was just like I, I couldn't understand it and then so obviously i started reading and there's this communication between the nervous system and the immune system so what you were saying is that if your mind and your thoughts are disconnected and you're not having the right signals being sent because thoughts are signals food is information everything is information to your body and so if you're not sending the right signals to your body you're obviously communicating with your immune system and then you're starting that chronic inflammatory process that we keep talking about and how that leads to this dysregulation so if you can do these interventions not only to build resiliency but what you can do is you can enhance that mind body connection which allows for more healing but getting your body ready for these procedures so to speak is also a part of it meaning that your body is going to respond as well as the kind of the body is set up for success so i always say because a lot of people do these therapies but they're not doing anything to prepare their body for it either so if, if your body is in a state of ready to kind of heal let's say is i think the success is going to be better i know it sounds a lot of voodoo-y but it, it i've seen it and if people if people believe a treatment is not going to work it's less likely to work and that's called the nocebo effect. People have heard of placebo effect, but there is something called nocebo effect, which has been studied. Yeah. All right. I love this. Okay. Now, with all this being said, I want to talk about some of the concerns. I want to talk about, number one, this can be transformative. As you know, pain is a huge motivator in our lives. A lot of times, just to get out of pain will do just about anything. And so having something that's effective and viable to help people who are struggling so much in their lives, because pain can just be that a big interruptive force with you just doing things that you wanna do in your life and making the most of this opportunity being a human. What about accessibility for people right now? Because obviously we can stack conditions in our favor with certain lifestyle, lifestyle practices, but again, something like chronic pain and not really being able to cut it with conventional treatments it's not working for folks. Is this going to be reserved right now for people who have accessibility to it? Because, you know, there's those barriers of finances, those those barriers of connections. Like a lot of this isn't even approved to be done here in the United States. Let's talk about that. Yeah. And that's why this is a long term vision is basically we build off build enough data and we show the work and there's a community of scientists it's not like i'm the only one doing it obviously there's so many people around the world doing amazing work and i think as we come together and show to the regulatory bodies and to the insurance companies that hey this is actually gonna save you money <laughs> just just take a take a knee pain example like if you do stem cells for the knee and it works you've saved thousands of dollars in surgery and the rehab and everything that comes from a knee replacement Right. And so you're actually saving the system a bunch of money. So it, to me, it almost doesn't make sense why this stuff isn't more accessible or isn't covered. Like in Japan, there are many stem cell procedures that are covered by insurance companies. So it's super accessible over there. But right now, you're right. It's, 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 it's fairly inaccessible. You have to travel out of country. You have to. Obviously, it's not covered by insurance. And then you also have to, you know, you also you're, you're kind of there's also predatory people out there. Right. Because medical tourism. Unfortunately, there's not a much oversight in like Mexico or Colombia and all these other countries where people are doing it. And so you have a lot of doctors who just are just, you know, taking advantage of vulnerable patients because when you're in chronic pain and or you have this chronic illness and you've tried everything, you're desperate for help. And you, if people are like, oh, stem cells will fix you. It's not that easy, right? Like someone's people aren't always candidates and you have to really individualize it and you have to look at them and, and you have to assess them and be honest with them. And that's I think that's something being a Canadian physician is a little bit different. I think we're just we're just taught to always just not think about the money aspect of things and just focus on like, how do we help our patients? And so to that end, we, we recently treated a bunch of military patients because, you know, we got a donation from a stem cell company to be able to treat them. And we are starting a foundation and a charity to help cover the cost for people. But that's obviously going to take time. Right. And these things, I think, over time are just like any technological innovation are become going to become cheaper. Right. You remember, I was like, I love the example of like plasma TVs in like 2003. They were like super expensive, <laughs> like fifty thousand dollars for like a TV. And now you can get them for like five hundred bucks. Right. And so selling gene therapy is going to be the same. The technology, the manufacturing process, the accessibility, all that stuff is going to improve over the next decade. All right. Let's talk about gene editing, because as soon as I hear that, I start thinking about, you know, <laughs> designer babies. I start thinking about being able to basically, you know, have a menu and pick what you want 
for, you know, for yourself, but also for offspring. And then getting to a place where we're like, this is the dominant race or dominant way a human should be or whatever the case might be. We already have little examples of this where there's a certain body type that people are manipulating their body to have that yeah and doing some of these sketchy surgeries for example yeah so let's talk about that a little bit yeah i mean just so people understand our gene therapy is not gene editing your body all it's doing is having a plasmid that's producing this peptide so ours is really cool that way because it's, it's very safe there's no off-site targets and we're not changing your genome but there's CRISPR, which has been around for a long time now. CRISPR is kind of like the world's premier gene editing technology. And to your point, this is what happened in China. And that doctor actually got arrested. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure they just did that as a... So basically he... For he, optics. For optics, exactly. <laughs> yeah, because I'm pretty sure they're doing in in China, they're already doing this because he gene edited embryos. And he gene edited embryos for saying that it was for helping them with the medical condition, but everyone, the medical condition wasn't really like, it wasn't actually true. And so that's why they, he, he went to jail and stuff. But the reality is the technology is out there mm -hmm. and there's, if he's doing it, what's stopping other doctors or scientists or people who are willing to pay and like, to do that stuff. And especially in other parts of the world where they may not have the same regulatory or, or ethical frameworks that we have. And so it does open this whole concept of designer babies and gene editing embryos and being able to customize them to have certain traits like increasing intelligence or or height or make them an athlete or this type of stuff Chinese right lebron james <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's not i mean it's technically it's technically a possibility but it's more about no no one is going to allow that like at least in the open public eye, say we're gene editing embryos because there's just so much ethical issues that have to be considered and i i i, I hope it I hope if it, it will most likely happen in our lifetimes, but the key is how do we create like a framework to regulate it properly? I think that's the key to it, right? It's just kind of like with this big, you know, not big tech stuff, right? Like it, we didn't realize how much harm these phones have on our bodies and for kids and all this stuff, but it's, it's, there's no regulation created around it. But now I think we know we probably shouldn't be giving them to children at a young age, right? But it's like this stuff. And, and so it, with any new technology, I think you have to think about, okay, what's this going to look like in 20, 30 years down the road? And how do we prevent from the bad players in the space from taking advantage of it? So one other concern with that, you know, I've got, I've got a few more, but yeah. one other kind of concern that might come to people's minds is regarding the stem cells themselves, right? So the accessibility, uh, viability of the highest quality, and I'm getting images, you know, not now, but previous to, you know, this conversation, also just I've been studying this for a little while, but I would get images of like the matrix and like all these babies jacked into <laughs> this, you know, and they're getting farmed for resources, right? Yeah. So can you, talk about this because you mentioned the embryonic stem cells earlier and there was a lot of controversy over that but where are we really at are, are we gonna require a bunch of babies jacked into the matrix for this no i i think that's the problem with especially in less developed countries like in india they recently made umbilical cord stem cells highly regulated to the point where they're essentially like banned now and the reason is because there's people take there's people taking advantage of like those for, the farms essentially where it's just like because people are a lot of them are desperate for money and then they'll just have the, the babies just for getting the tissue and donate and making some money off of it so the way we do it which i think is the most ethical way is that after c-section births where it's going to be thrown out anyway you have the option to throw it out or you have the option to donate it and so that's kind of the way we do it and that's that's how we collect them and then there's obviously processes on donor selection and testing there's a lot of nuance that goes into making sure these cells are safe because you're right you are putting cells into your body and you want to make sure they're not going to cause any harm and cells can kind of cause harm if they're not grown properly the most common issue that happens in these other places in especially like in in colombia and panama and these other places that are doing stem cells is that they do they do too many passages which is how many times you change the cell culture flask and it's called replicative stress. So if you basically you grow the stem cells too much, or you replicate them too many times, then you a lot of them do like six passages, eight, ten, and essentially it decreases the cell viability. And then the cells can actually become senescent, and then that causes more issues because <laughs> they become inflamed, right? Then they become senescent cells that cause inflammation. And so, and then your immune system has to deal with that and clear it up. 
So our cells, we minimize the passages to three. And that's something I learned in Asia from the Japanese scientists doing it for a long time. And then also the culture medium, how you grow them. And there's all these like details. So I've done a lot of research and detail, like working with scientists from around the world to kind of figure out at least um, for now, what's the best way to manufacture them? And this is, for, there is a, that's the biggest nuance though, is we have something called early passage stem cells. And then we also, the other thing to remember is these cells are not integrating with your DNA. They're actually, they're sending, they stay there and then they send signals to your body's own stem cells to start healing and regeneration. So there, there might be a little bit of engraftment, meaning some of them might stick around, uh, but they're not like, it's not like you're going to become that person. You're not going to have that person's DNA in your body type of thing. Cause a lot of people think that. And so that's, it's not, they're, they're actually, there's been animal studies done where it shows most of the stem cells are cleared up within four weeks, but then they're, they're sending signals right. and the signals that they send are, that's why it can have long-term or permanent results. It's fascinating. One of the things that I really admire about your work is that you have a lot of tools in your toolkit. And I would imagine that this is going to be personalized. Right. It's based on the needs of the person and their goals versus, again, just and this is one of the things we can get caught up in in conventional treatments, which is this kind of standard of care like this is yeah. just, you know, and so I, I love that so much. And now the question is, how do people get access to you? How do they get more information? How do they get access? You've got an event coming up, as a matter of fact, that people can. Yeah. Attend. Austin, Texas, we got. Dave Asprey, Ben Greenfield, Tom Bilyeu. We got a pretty cool lineup of like influencer type guys, but then we got some amazing scientists like the inventor of the mini circle technology, Walter Patterson and Mac Davis. They, they're the other uh, founders of the mini circle company that I work with and they're brilliant people. So, and then we have uh, Andy O'Brien, who's the top trainer in North America. And I don't say that lightly. His first client was Sidney Crosby, who's the top NHL player. But he's at one point he was working with the top five athletes in North America. So he's uh, like he's worked with, you know, Steph Curry, Tom Brady, like a lot of uh, like top guys. So he's an amazing trainer and he's going to be talking about fitness and longevity. So it's a very unique lineup that I think people will really enjoy. And to your point, I have such a broad tool set because I saw all these people in the system not getting better. And so for me, it was always about trying to alleviate suffering and trying to help these patients. Because I'm, like I said, I was a sports doctor by training, but then how did I get into all this other stuff? It was, just, it was honestly just a desire to want to help people who weren't getting help. And I was like, how do I help this person? And I just kind of, kind of kept reading and learning from different people. Amazing, amazing. So where can people get just into your world a little bit more? Well, our website, eterna.health. So our company is called Eterna. And then my Instagram at dr.acon. I am super inaccessible at the moment, <laughs> but I do have a team of doctors who are amazing, who've been trained by me, and they're wonderful, and they can help take care of lots of patients. Amazing. And also, where, where can people get information about this event if they want to come and hang out? Yeah, on our website, eterna.health, and there's an event page there. There's still some tickets left, and hopefully people who are interested in this space can make it out there to Austin. It'll be a fun time, and it'll be a cool audience, too. Like, we got Joan McDonald, Chris Duffin, some cool people who are in the space. Gabrielle, I think, will be there, too, and so it'll be a fun, fun networking event, too. Awesome. So as of this recording and, and this publication, folks, you still got a couple of weeks to get tickets if there's any left <laughs> so definitely pop over to the website and you know many of the people you mentioned are good friends and yeah it's going to be a good time and i just want to thank you so much for having the audacity and the the, the strength the perseverance uh the the self-exploration you know just being really dedicated to learning and to serving because that's what it really boils down to at the end of the day and it's also really cool that you have the ability to articulate these things and share it with people because you know, a lot of times that's another big problem with our current system is that there's so many fascinating discoveries that are happening that the general public, people who can actually use it in their lives, it might take 10 years, 20, even in the age of the internet, for people to become aware of these things. Yeah, it's, it's a, called a clinical translation gap. It's about 15 to 20 years. Ridiculous. <laughs> so Ridiculous. I'm trying to make that obviously, and that's part of the reason there's amazing scientists doing amazing work but they can't always communicate it or get it out there. So that's, I feel like that's part of my mission now. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with all of us. This has been awesome, man. Thank yeah, you. thanks for having me. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. I'm a scientist. What scientists do is that we are interested in looking at the origins of things. So where does fat come from? Like fat doesn't just automatically come up when we're adult and we want to actually lose some weight. Turns out what's amazing is that fat forms when we're in the womb.